Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the workshop of 2023, Water in Communications. But this is the last work for, workshop for June. Uh, I'm really glad that you are joining us today as well. We have a special focus on science communication. And for those of you who are new or just joined today, my name is Jürgen Esplund, and I will be your host. I think it's time for me now to introduce our very first speaker of the day, Jenny Metcalf, Director, uh, eConnect Communication, and more than 30 years of experience as a science communicator. We're very pleased to have you on the program. The session is called Bring Science to Life <laughs> and New Audiences. So I leave it, I leave the floor to you. Welcome. Thank you very much, Garol. Now you will see on the slide that I've crossed out audiences. <laughs> and I probably should have done that when the planning was happening because audiences to me has um, a negative con connotation. So if you look at this slide here, it gives the definition of audience. It can be a group of listeners or spectators that could be reading, viewing, listening, a group of ardent admirers or devotees, um, a formal hearing or an interview, or the act of, of the audience hearing you. And all of that presumes very much what I call one-way communication. Now, this has been called in the science communication world deficit communication, um, where there's a presumed deficit of knowledge that people may need um, to understand their world and to understand science. I don't like that term deficit, so I like to talk about the dissemination model in that knowledge is disseminated, but it's disseminated in one direction. And science communication has moved beyond that to much more of um, conversations and dialogue and even participation. This is a picture of um, a scientist, a couple of scientists on the left-hand side and in the middle, talking to um, some Aboriginal people in Australia about the health of their river, which, <coughs> which you can see next door. So they're not telling them about the health, they are asking them about the health of the river. There's a conversation that is happening there. And I was lucky enough to be involved in that a number of years ago. It's in, this, this happened in the far northwest of Australia um, in a remote area where the scientists were asking the indigenous people what they valued about their river and what they saw as a healthy river. And I'll come back to that during the presentation. Today, I'm gonna to look at three things, three Cs. I'm gonna look at the challenges of communicating science. I'm gonna look at the context that we need to understand if we really wanna communicate about science. And I'm gonna talk about how we can connect for change. So they're the three things that I'll be talking about today. So firstly, to challenges. Now, uh, a couple of, yeah, about two years ago now, I was fortunate to be with a group of about 21 others involved in science communication at the Bellagio um, Rockefeller Foundation. And we spent four days talking about science communication. What are the challenges? What are the ways we can deal with those challenges? They came up with these 10 challenges that um, are listed on this um, graph here. I then earlier this year tested these challenges with the Public Communication of Science and Technology Network community to see how important they thought the challenges were on a scale of one to five. And you can see that they're all well above three um, on that, of that scale there as being perceived as being important challenges. However, I thought the first one, the most important one right up the top is something we often forget. And that is that marginalized groups are sometimes excluded from science engagement, from how we engage with people. And that's true when we try to engage people on water issues. There are often people who are marginalized 
and who are excluded. The one that gets all the press is the disinformation, misinformation, and that whole pseudoscience conspiracy theories. Yes, it's important, but there are other issues that are out there. And then there's the, there was a whole lot of things about the support for science communication, a low awareness by policymakers and funders of the value of science communication, a lack of resources and funding and recognition for science communication. And then it came down to the science communicators themselves. Um, what are their assumptions and misperceptions that they may have about the people they're communicating with? Now I crossed out audience and I've put the word publics here, but you'll notice that it's plural. So it's many publics and there are many different groups and understanding those groups is really important. Um, and then you'll see decreasing trust in science, the polarizing nature of science, and a focus on the promotion rather than in the engagement with science. Um, so you can see that there's, there's a, um, are you still seeing my screen? Okay, I'm not, now I am. Yes, we do. Uh, there's, yeah, there's a whole raft of different issues that are out there and challenges. They, they could perhaps be, summarized by this quote by one, which was in response to one of the open-ended questions in the survey. And that is that we haven't as a profession reached a safe and adequate level of maturity. We're a vulnerable profession still, particularly when it comes to institutional and political support and also change in that process. So the value of science communication really has not been recognized at the levels that I believe it needs to, to do so and that many others also think. And then the third challenge that I have here, which relates back to one of the, the that, that, that graph, is this focus on trust and dissemination. And here are some, just three articles that I quickly grabbed out of this. Um, the first one there, did World Economic Forum order governments to begin rationing water? Conspiracy theories. The Union of Concerned Scientists, what's the difference between disinformation and misinformation? And US health and science bodies unite to fight misinformation infodemic. And a lot of the rhetoric that we hear amongst organized science and policymakers today is about the need to regain public trust and to deal with these issues of misinformation and disinformation. Now, I agree that all those things are important but I think too much emphasis is put on this at the expense of understanding the context in which science communication and engagement happens. And too much emphasis is put on this, which is essentially one-way communication, the dissemination, the information that is being transferred. Um, so one of the calls that I make is for us all to have a better look at the context that are out there. And there's a number of contexts that I think are important. The first one is about the actual nature of science itself, when it's taken out of the lab, out of the research environment and into the real world. So this is a, a photo of a, wo a woman irrigating her crops in uh, Rwanda and um, she is irrit irrigating as part of a group of women who got together and explained their needs about what they needed in terms of increasing their irrigation potential. Before that, a lot of the research had designed irrigation systems that were heavy and hard to use and more suited to men than women. So the science said that they all worked, but the context, the gender context said they didn't. And so, Often the science we're dealing with, and this is just one example, is conditional um, on, on what happens when you put it into the real world. By understanding the women's context, you can see the success of, um, of what happened in the quote by Vivian there, um, where she talks about the fact that they now don't only have money, but they have leadership opportunities um, and, a, and an ability to have a voice within their community. So that's the first context, 
that science is conditional and there are many applications of this whole idea of conditionality, especially if you think about the fact that a lot of science, including water science, is multi-transdisciplinary and they will approach problems from their own perspectives. And it's only by bringing those together that we can actually really understand the context in the real world. And that's a call for that transdisciplinary, uh, multidisciplinary focus to happen. The second context is that people have differing values. And I'm sure many of you have heard the saying that facts are not enough. And there's a lot of recent research to show that facts are definitely not enough. They don't change people's attitudes and opinions. And you just need to have a, a read of some of the um, effects of communication during the, the COVID pandemic to, to realise that. That even when facts were given, the best evidence was given, people made different decisions based on their own values, their own context um, and where they were. Back to the Fitzroy River in northwestern Australia, um, the scientists asked the First Nation people what they valued about their river. One of the things that they valued about their river was the ability to catch these small little um, prawn-like or um, prawn-like prawn uh, animals called um, cherubins. And they use a net like this to do it. So part of the process that the scientists set up with the indigenous rangers was to measure how many cherubim they caught when they cast a net like this at relevant, relevant intervals. So in, instead of doing a Western science way of measuring the animals, they used a local method based on their values to measure the health, one aspect of the health of their river. So remembering that people have different values that they bring is really important. And, and, and that's not perceived when there's one way, just one way, only one way communication. The third context is that past history matters. Now, this is um, a picture of the Murray-Darling Basin, which is um, Australia's largest river system. And it, um, for those of you who are involved in water science and you've, if you've ever had, looked at anything to do with Australia, you would have heard about the Murray-Darling Basin and the Murray-Darling Basin Commission and then Authority. And um, there's a lot of poli politics around the management of the river, particularly the allocation of water for environmental purposes, um, as well as for, for other uses like irrigation, farming, and urban uses. So there's a lot of politics around that. And um, a number of years ago, I was involved in doing some consultation around um, the, 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 to develop a communication strategy. And, um, and one of the people said, we are sick of, of slimy men in shiny suits coming in to tell us what to do. Now, um, and this is an article that was a few years ago saying it's time to restore public trust. So when the Murray-Darling Basin Authority puts out information, it does so in this context. So people may dismiss the science that they put out based on their past history with that organisation. And that's important. And likewise, the history of how science and policy interact is important. Um, for example, um, during COVID, um, people rejected some of the things that government said um, that were about science because they didn't like the government, not because they didn't like the science. It was because they didn't like the government. Um, and so these past experiences that people have with organised science and policy institutions affects how they see the science that is communicated and whether they reject or accept it, which has nothing to do with the content of that science. And so that, that, that idea of past history mattering is really important. The other thing, the other, another context is that other knowledge is important. 
policy makers, people like you and me, make decisions based on a whole range of things, not just the science. Um, and that knowledge can also benefit our, our research into science, our exploration of the science. Um, in Australia, a lot of the Indigenous groups, and this is an area in the Northern Territory around the Catherine River area, um, the Indigenous people got together and developed what we called a seasonal calendar, which shows you in all the different seasons what animals and plants in and near the river they expect to see. And this sort of knowledge is really important for scientists who are, who are looking to see, well, what changes have happened because of changes in land use or climate change. Um, and they can see based on this ancient indigenous knowledge, what changes there might, might have happened in, in that process. So it's important to bring other knowledge, not just science content to the table in our science communication. And I think that's becoming increasingly recognized. So how can we translate this into connecting for change? Well, to understand dialogue, to understand the context, sorry, we really need to have conversations. We need to have a dialogue. And that's two-way communication at the very least. And two particular things we need to do with that communication is to ask questions, find out where the, where the people that we're wanting to engage with and communicate with, what are their contexts? What are their values? What are their past history and experiences in this space that we're dealing in? We also need to um, find out what knowledge they have that could be useful for solving particular problems that science is also seeking to, to, um, to solve and, and, and treating that on a more or less equal basis. So, that dialogue, that two-way communication is really, really important. And going a step further, there's also a participatory approach to communication where scientists are just one of the groups. There may be other, other publics that are brought in, not just one, and that there's a communication in multiple different directions. My arrows just go in one direction, but that's because I'm not good at graphics. Um, they, they should go in all different directions in this diagram to show that, that this dialogue, this communication, this participation with each other can happen in ma many different scales. However, I'm not throwing out this one-way communication. It's still important and is often demanded um, certainly projects that I've worked on where I have um, run large scale participatory science communication programs, we've had to include dissemination as part of that. But what we find in those programs is that if they've had some participation with each other, if they've developed relationships of trust, then the dissemination actually happens far more effectively than it would have otherwise. Now, I realise I'm talking on a smaller scale than a mass scale here, but we can also look at how do we develop relationships of trust and understanding on a mass scale, not just on a, a smaller scale as well. And all of this comes back to what I consider to be the most important skill um, that you can have as a science communicator. And it is, I think, the most difficult skill to do well, whether you're communicating professionally or personally. And it requires what I call an active listening process. And it's something that, that we all get wrong all the time, but it really does make a difference. And I use the acronym of LACE to explain it. So the first point there is to listen, to ask the question and listen to the answer without interrupting, <laughs> without saying what you think. <laughs> listen to the answer. You might then acknowledge what they say. I hear that you are saying that you are concerned about the erosion of the riverbanks in this area. 
Um, and that does a, a bit of a, a, a check as well. Clarify anything you don't understand. I'm not quite sure what you meant by this when you said that. And then ask for more information, dig down and ask for more information. And it takes quite a discipline to achieve that process. Um, but if you do that and you, you're, you, and if people come to you and they say, uh, but what do you think about that? Say, I've heard your question, I've written it down and I'll come back to you and, and discuss that with you soon. But listening, really actively listening requires that discipline of you not saying anything for a period of time. And then you can come back and address some of the questions that they may have raised. So in conclusion, um, what happened in this study here was that the indigenous uh, rangers of the Fitzroy River told the scientists that they, what they cared about with their river. It was different to what a scientist might think about with river health. What they cared about was that they had nice places for their family to meet by the river that was free of litter. What they cared about was that they had river holes where they could um, uh, recreationally swim, dive in and play in. What they cared about was that they could still catch cherubin and the barramundi fish that were in the river. And so the scientists worked with these um, elders to set up ways in which they could regularly monitor that the health of that. And here, here Marcus is, is explaining how to use a photo to take photo points to check on the litter that might be happening um, in a certain part of the river. So um, I would encourage you all to listen, to find out the context and to go beyond, don't throw it out, but go beyond one-way communication to engage in a dialogue and to participate with the people that you're communicating with. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jenny. Thank you very much. And before we go to uh, questions, uh, we have some comments here that I wanted to read out also about listening. Uh, Afia says, so important to have an attitude of listening instead of telling as indigenous, indigenous knowledge feeding into the heart science has a value. And then she continues also that in Pakistan, academia as well as water management are referring to the way uh, Murray Darling Basin is managed uh, because it being a very good example also of um, Pakistani water issues. So um, that's that's one comment. And uh, Mariana says, how do we progress from active listening to required action? <laughs> that's a very good question. Um, I, th I think what happens is that once you understand the context, I mean, I did, and it depends on the situation, obviously, but ideally, once you understand the context, you can work together to then work out what might be the, the best solution, the best way forward. But you recognising the context really makes a difference. But, I mean, even in understanding the context, your messages, your dissemination is going to be better because part of developing clear risk communication messages um, is to think about what an audience could get wrong unless you stress the correct information. And so understanding what an audience could get wrong, or I shouldn't say an audience, but they are in the dissemination pathway, understanding what they could get wrong helps you to design a message more clearly and that you can understand what they could get wrong by understanding the context better. Okay, thank you. And uh, we also have uh, Natalia saying, thank you for the useful talk. My question is how a scientist can reach policymakers to convey the importance of upgrading wastewater treatment plants in Ukraine um, for nutrient removal. Now, many funds are allocated to immediately, uh, in, indefinitely environmental damage caused by war. However, um, wastewater Treatment plants also cause environmental damage because in contrast to EU, Ukraine's regulations do not oblige municipal water companies to remove phosphorus and nitrogen compounds from wastewater. 
uh, and I have several publications, but I don't know how to bring them to policymakers. I don't know how to bring to policymakers the understanding of the problem. So basically the question, more general terms, how do we bring scientific knowledge to policymakers and make them understand that we have urgent problems that need, and they need to help solving, regulating, et cetera? Well, I think, again, it comes back to understanding the context of the policy context and also the context of the publics of those policymakers. They all have constituent publics, um, particularly in a democracy, people who vote for them, people who, who give them the authority to be in the position of policymaking. Um, and so um, at a very broad level, um, it's not just the science, but you need to be able to remember that whole idea of conditionality. It's also about saying, well, what is the situation? What are the publics that are there? And what are their attitudes to that? What's their understanding of that? And through them, you can get to, to the policy uh, makers through um, media, including social media, but more effectively through personal contacts. So finding out who the key policymakers are and their advisors who are looking after um, water treatment plants or water management um, is, is a really important step. Finding out what interests them, who they listen to, and I'm sure that they would, be, um, would have some connections with scientists somewhere that they might be seeking their advice off. So finding out who those people are and, and trying to have a dialogue is really important. Um, but understanding where they're coming from and their context and their needs will be the, the, the point where you can create that connection with them. Right, thank you. Is this also where trust building comes into the picture? I mean, if we have built trust or if we are building trust with policymakers or their advisor, advisors, we will reach further, correct? Well, there, there are, I think, two types of trust. There's, um, there is what I call institutional trust, um, which is trust in people that you don't really know. It's in, in a, it could be trust in a scientific body, it could be trust in a government institution, could be trust in an NGO. And that trust is gained through the way in which those, those um, entities are seen to treat public issues. So Sorry, just, if they're just, you, we lost you there. The, 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 we, the last thing we heard was entities. And I think you said then, right. yeah. Trust is gained, those, those entities gain trust by the way in which they're, they're, they are perceived to treat public issues and the people who are involved in that. So it could be that, that you know, that they... They do try to consult with the public, that they do make efforts to do that, that they have a reputation of being accessible, whatever it might be, that is how trust in those, those, those institutions is formed. But for me, a more powerful form of trust, particularly in the policy sphere, is uh, in interpersonal trust. And interpersonal trust is gained through dialogue and participation with each other. Uh, I worked with a group of farmers in Australia over a six year period um, on climate risk. And it was a participatory science communication program involving climate scientists, agricultural scientists and farmers. And over the course of that six years, they developed friendships, they developed trust they developed an openness, which meant that they could communicate um, information in a much more risk-free environment because they, they understood the context. All right, thank you. And then we have two observations from Narissa here. The first one, uh, with all the respect, the point about past history is too general, is too general to focus only on relationship with politicians, even when it's true the history of mistrust. So I suggest to put clear focus there or using more examples. The past history can also be one of natural phenomena. Do you want to comment on that or? 
Yeah, I'm not totally sure what she means by the last point. The past history can also be one of natural phenomena. Um, but yeah, by past history, I, I'm talking, this is part of researching and understanding the context. Um, so part of, of when I developed a communication strategy quite a while ago for the then Murray-Darling Basin Commission was finding out how they perceived that commission. And, and it was often based on past experiences with, that, with um, that, the commission. And so looking at ways to overcome that which could include, for example, having representative people from the community as an advisory body, which is something that they did. Um, the way in which they then communicate with these groups, rather than sending out people, flying out people on a one-on-one -on -one, um, to, to lecture them, having a, more of a dialogue. So understanding that helps you to think about well, what are the communication strategies that are gonna work given this past history. Right, thank you. Maybe that was a good clarification uh, needed there. Natalia, who asked about um, the, the previous questions um, about building trust basically says, thank you for the advice. However, it is difficult to implement sometimes. And yes, it is difficult sometimes to build trust um, and very time consuming, I guess. Yes, um, well, what I would say is that if you're looking at mass communication, um, then I would be focusing more on um, understanding the context than, than trying to build blanket trust for the sake of it. Um, that would be my advice. Um, I think at the moment there's too much effort being put into um, controlling this and this information and artificial intelligence which, which I agree has to happen, but at the same time, we're losing sight of, of how we can really engage because it's, it's not the facts that will engage, it's, it's an, an understanding of the context through dialogue and participation that will really engage and create change. Um, but interpersonal trust, which you can gain through dialogue and participation, I think is, is super important. I'm not saying the other trust isn't important, I'm just saying there's more emphasis. There's too much emphasis currently being placed on it. Marissa just clarified that by natural phenomena, she meant drought floods, uh, for instance. Um, of course, of course, Marissa. And, and that, will, that will affect relationships between various groups um, and affect how the science is perceived. Um, and my country is a land of flooding rains and droughts. So um, we know that only too well. Yeah. And and the, the politics and the context around that, which can affect how science is communicated. Right. We have one more uh, reflection here from Marissa um, or an observation. The second one about then targeting different audiences is super important, as well as the different possibilities of the directions of communications and not mapping that out. Uh, makes our strategies weak. Uh, do you want to comment on that, uh, Jenny? Yes, my number one science communication principle is understand who you're communicating with. And to, to understand who you're communicating with, um, you need to be clear about who those people are. Um, and that might mean um, developing segments of various public groups who are different for different reasons and then understanding what makes them different um, and how and, and each group will want to be communicated in a different way and have different needs and different concerns and different perceptions. So I start any communication strategy with identifying the target groups and secondly understanding those target groups. Right, thank you. Good concrete uh, suggestions there. Uh, our time is running out, um, unfortunately. Time goes very quickly. Um, thank you, Jenny, very much for joining us and uh, the Water Communications Program. Uh, it was a pleasure having you here. And um, we are going to move on in the program. Thank you. Now it's time to introduce our next speaker, Anders Salman. And some of you who joined us 
last year for this uh, communications class or this communications training. Um, recognizes Andis as a presentation coach with a very long experience from science communication, but also with a parallel career as an actor and a stand up comedian. And that has given you a lot of stage experience yes, that you actually use also when you work, for instance, as a moderator. Today, you're joining us for a more practical coaching, and um, you're going to give us some essential tools to get our messages across. Over to you, Anderson. Welcome. Thank you very much, Joel, for that introduction. And I'd like to say hi, everyone. And uh, I'm glad that you are joining this session, which will be about crafting your message to the general public, the very difficult target group of the general public. So I will try to give you as much value as possible during these 40 minutes. And I will actually echo some of the things that Jenny mentioned uh, in her previous uh, talk. I will give you concrete tools and tips for how to present and communicate your research in an effective and engaging way. So you already know how to talk to your peers. This is for when you go outside of that group. As you heard, I will address you all as if you are researchers, but the concepts in this workshop will work for any other area of expertise. Or if you are an experienced communicator, you can regard this as a sort of a train the trainer session where you can learn some methodology which you can apply when coaching your own sciences. And those of you who joined last year will recognize some concept, but I encourage you to take part in it uh, as well, because I will expand on some things. And it always um, helps when you do things one more time, because, you know, repetition is the key to uh, successful knowledge. Before we start, I would like to say that this is a very practical session, so please take out pen and paper and have them ready on your desk, because I will give you exercises to do in front of your computer, and you will get a lot more value out of the workshop if you follow along with me. Would that be all right? So uh, I'd like you now to use the reaction button here in the menu below and uh, raise, I will use the raise hand function a bit. So uh, perfect. I see several of you have already uh, discovered that raise hand function. Perfect. And I see you are engaged and uh, want to, get, to move along into the workshop. So uh, as Joril said previously, if you have any questions uh, along the way, please write them down in the chat and we will take them up during the Q&A session. So after this session, you will have a structure for your pitch or your presentation. You will uh, get some tools for creating your pitch or presentation, and you will also get some ideas on how to develop your pitch or presentation. I will also tell you what I think are the two most important tips to becoming a better speaker, but we'll save that for later on. So uh, use the raise hand function now uh, with me when I ask you, so how many of you have once or twice in the whole of your life ever heard a boring presentation? Let's see, hands up. Yes, I can see many hands up here on this uh, question. Yes, I think we've all done that. Thank you very much. So now I ask you the next, next question. So how many of you have ever in, your, in the whole of your life know that you have ever done a boring presentation? I can raise hands on that, absolutely. And I see several also raise hands. Thank you very much for your honesty. Right? We've all been there, haven't we? So um, what is it then that makes a presentation, well, less engaging? Well, in my opinion, I believe it's three things, but we only have time to talk about two of them. So the first thing I want to talk about is that it's the order, it's the structure of the presentation. We usually try to tell everything in chronological order, in the order that the, we think is the most logical. 
So the main problem here is the structure of the presentation, because it isn't evident that the most logical structure is the most interesting. And we'll get back to that. I will give you a, present, a structure for a pitch or presentation that you can use. And the good thing about that structure is that it works for short pitches as well as longer presentation. Now, the second thing is that we often include too much information. We try to tell the audience everything we, we know about a subject or about our research. Uh, many researchers that I meet and coach seem to have the mindset of being as neutral as possible. Like, I'm only here to tell information. So I tell the audience as much information as possible, and then they can decide what's most important. But that is impossible. Because no matter what you are presenting, you are the expert in the room. So you must choose what parts of your project or your research are the most effective and interesting to tell the audience about. Um, I believe that's a strategy that it's intended to avoid questions. We don't want the audience to sit and wonder or, or, or question something that we've said on stage. But then on the other hand, when do we become most interested in something? It's actually when we don't get to know everything, when there are unanswered questions in the presentation, when you sit there and wonder, wow, how did they achieve that? What will happen now? How will they do that? So that's the goal of a presentation. We want to ignite the other person's interests so that he or she starts asking questions and starts thinking about your project. And that's really coming back to what Jenny talked about, um, engaging in conversation and dialogue. So for the sake of time, this, se this session, we will concentrate on the pitch. A pitch is a very short summary of your research or communication project, 60 seconds or less. But what is actually the goal of a pitch? Many people think that a pitch should be like a little box containing everything about a subject in a very short time. That is sort of self-contained. But I like to think of it this way. A pitch is the start of a conversation. You can write this down. A pitch is the start of a conversation. And a presentation can also be start of a conversation as well. So what is the most interesting things you can say about your research that will spark a conversation? That is something you should always keep in mind when doing a presentation. Right, let's get down to business. So the way this will work is I will ask you a set of questions. And for each question, you will get one minute to answer that question. But I don't want you to try to find the perfect answer to each question because there are no perfect answers. Instead, I want you to write down as many answers as possible, as many ideas you can think of, because this will give you the building blocks to create your pitch. So can we agree on this? Not trying to find the, the perfect answer, but to write down as many answers as possible. Let me see some hands here. Absolutely. Great, great. I see you're up for the task here. Perfect. So the first thing we're going to do is to decide on the big idea. The big idea is the main message that you want to convey in your pitch or your presentation. Remember when I said that we often include too much information in a presentation? That's because we haven't decided on what our big idea for the presentation will be because this will help you to sort out information that is not relevant for conveying your big idea. So think about it this way. If there was one thing the audience could remember about your research of your presentation, what would that be? What's the one thing I want the audience to remember about my research? Now, 
I will show you an example of this big idea. This uh, is an example from Hans Rosling, who was Sweden's most famous science communicator in his time. He's uh, unfortunately deceased now. But this is a very old clip from his first TED talk. I think this is like from 2006 or something. So it's very, very old and you probably have seen it already. But I would like to show this as an example of a big idea. So here it goes. In 1962, there was really a group of countries here that was industrialized countries, and they had small families and long lives. And these were the developing countries. They had large families, and they had relatively short lives. Now, what has happened since 1962? We want to see the change. Are the students right? It's still two types of countries. Or have these developing countries got smaller families, and they live here? Or have they got longer lives and live up there? Let's see, we start the world. And this is all UN statistics that has been available. Here we go. Can you see there? It's China. They're moving against better health. They're improving there. All the green Latin American countries, they are moving towards smaller families. Your yellow ones here are the Arabic countries, and they get larger families, but they, no, longer life, but not larger families. The Africans are the green down here. They still remain here. This is India. Indonesia is moving on pretty fast. And in the 80s here, you have Bangladesh still among the African countries there, but not Bangladesh. It's a miracle that happens in the 80s. The imams start to promote family planning and they move up into that corner. And in 90s, we have the terrible HIV epidemic that takes down the life expectancy of the African countries and all the rest of the world moves up into the corner where we have long lives and small family and we have a completely new world. What's Hans Rosling's big idea here? Well, it isn't uh, look what cool graphs I made, or look how funny I am that I can speak like a sports commentator to these graphs. Um, it's it's the world is getting also, better, thanks. right? The world uh, is sorry, Anders. Anders, we, yes. we lost you there for after you said speaker mode, uh, then the uh, internet froze somehow. Okay, right. You can see me now. Yes, we can. Okay, right. So I was talking about Hans Rosling's big idea here. It wasn't how funny he is that he can talk to like a sports commentator or that he has these graphs. It's about the main message. The world is getting better or the world is not as we think it is. In other presentations he made, he didn't use these graphs at all. He used, used cardboard boxes, toilet rolls, or even a washing machine. But these were just tool tools to convey the big idea, the main message. So it's uh, quite uh, daunting to have that kind of a big, big idea in your presentation or your pitch, but I mean, everyone can find a core in what they are doing. And if you have trouble coming up with a big idea, think about it this way. What is the new thing I can tell the audience? Because we love learning about new things. So some you might think, oh, they might know something about this, they might know something about this, but this is the new thing that I can add to this conversation. So let's write down as many big ideas you can think of starting now. Okay, that's one minute. Now you've written down a lot of suggestions for a big idea. You can have several big ideas in a longer presentations, and you can have different big ideas depending on who you talk to, um, connecting to what we talked about before, about uh, uh, different audiences or different publics. Uh, but in this pitch, I would just concentrate on one big idea, but that big idea could change depending on who you talk to. So 
now I will give you that structure I, I mentioned before. Remember when I said before that one of the problems with boring presentations is the structure. Well, here is a suggestion for a structure that you can start to experiment with. It looks like this. You start by explaining the problem. Then you talk about the solution to the problem. Then you talk about the benefits that your research can do. Or then you finish off with an action to the audience. And we will go through these parts separately. But please write down the structure for, um, for now so you have it in front of you. So we will go through each part now, uh, starting with the problem. Because what is the most effective way of engaging with an audience? How do you make an audience listen to you immediately? You tell them a story. Because there's something about stories that immediately catches our attention. We all sit there and wonder, how is it, go how is it going to end? So I do workshop for st in storytelling for scientists where we go through a whole structure for how to create a story from your research. But I would say the most important part of that structure is the problem. Because every good story contains a problem that must be solved. So what is the problem that your project wants to solve? And I'm not talking about the research question itself. With problem, I mean the overarching problem that your project contributes to solve. So some people would say that this is the background, but by phrasing it as a problem, you'll catch the audience's attention more effectively. Because as soon as we lear learn that there is a problem to be solved, we immediately get interested. So... Um, I'm making, I'm making things up now, but as an example, if, if I study a certain bacteria in water that causes a, a certain kind of disease, uh, I don't start talking about that bacteria. I start talking about the disease, how many are affected each year, what the symptoms are, and, and, uh, and why there isn't a cure for this disease right now. That is the problem. So it's a way of setting the stage. And when describing the problem, uh, you can use some tricks also from storytelling, because when we tend to describe a problem, sometimes our language tends to be uh, quite generalized and abstract. So in tr instead, try to go the opposite way. Be very specific. Use data, use analogies, use comparisons, use examples. So for example, instead of uh, telling you about the disease I just mentioned, I could tell them, I uh, could tell you about a certain person living with that disease and, and how that person person's everyday life is. That's more of an example than then I can do the data. Um, you can also tell us something about what's at stake here. What happens if we don't manage to solve the problem? Or, or opposite, what happens if we manage to solve the problem? What could be possible then? So write down as many suggestions as possible for the question, uh, what problem will my research help to solve? That's one minute. Great job, everyone. Next thing is to talk about the solution. So what is your approach to solving this problem? So I've set the stage by talking about the disease. Now I tell the audience, so I study a certain bacteria that might play a part in this uh, disease. So what is your approach to solving the problem? What do you do? Write down as many suggestions as possible, starting now.
Okay, great. Great job, everyone. Uh, as a reminder, you don't have to write down your answers in the chat. Just write them down in the paper on the paper in front of you and write down as many answers as possible. Okay, so as a very important subset of the solution part of the structure are the results of your research. So you can write this down. People buy results. People buy results. They don't buy how you do something. They buy what will come out of it. In the simplest way, think of a shampoo commercial. They don't show you the factory where the shampoo is made and what, what chemicals they have in the shampoo. They show you what luscious and beautiful hair you get when you use the shampoo. So people are more interested in results than how you do stuff. Most researchers spend the greater part of the presentations on the how part, but I'm sorry, that's the least interesting thing for an audience to listen to. This is where, that's where it gets, it's easy to get stuck on details that are, that are not relevant to convey your big idea. So results before how. So results can be of different kinds. They can be quantitative, they can be qualitative, or they also uh, might include some effects that your project will achieve in the best of worlds. So when I say results, I mean them quite broadly. And if you are very early in your research and you have no results yet, what would be the perfect results to achieve in a perfect world? And uh, think of it this way. What is or will be in the world after your project that wasn't there before? So write down as many suggestions as possible for one minute starting now. That's one minute. So the next step is the benefit. Who or what will benefit from your results? All research impacts something or someone, and we want to know who or what that is. But again, be very specific here, because often when I ask researchers this question, uh, so who, uh, who, does your, who or what does your research impact? The answer, well, it could impact everyone. Okay, right, but if, you're trying to be more specific, what would you say? Well, then I would say probably the end users. Okay, so who are the end users? Uh, well, they can be managers. So what kind of managers? So we continue down this, this path. So try to be very, very specific because this will help the audience to understand your research more and it will also help you. Later on, when you have your results, you will know who you will contact to tell, your, tell them about your results. Um, connecting to what we said before about mapping strategies for how to disseminate your results. So you can think of it that who is the first person I'm going to call to tell about my results to. So write down who, as many suggestions as possible for who or what benefits from my research. Um, for one minute, starting now.
one minute. Great work, everyone. Now, the last part is the action. Remember when I said that a pitch or a presentation is the start of a conversation? Well, now it's time to start that conversation with the audience because most presentations end passively. There's a big thank you slide behind the speaker and they say, I think that's all for me and they go off stage. But how can you end the presentation more actively? What do you want the listener to do when they've heard your pitch or presentation? What action do you want them to take? It can be a million things. As the, a simple thing is to say where they can learn more about your research or how they can get in contact with you. Or uh, do you want them to donate to a cause, for example, or sign a petition or take part in a research project? Maybe you have a challenge right now that you want some input on. If you're telling the pitch in a, to a person in, in, in the coffee line to a conference, Maybe you can finish with a question to get the conversation going. So what do you think of blah, blah, blah? There are a million things you can do, but the important thing is not to end in a passive way. So think about your action. What do you want the listener to do now? One minute starting now. Great, that's one minute. So now you have created lots of building blocks for to your pitch. And these building blocks, you can then expand to create one or several different pitches. But I will give you three things to talk about and to think about when putting uh, your pitch together. So the first thing is to write a script. Uh, if your pitch is 60 seconds or less, uh, it's very valuable to write a script for this because it's the process of writing the script itself, the choosing of what to include, how to phrase it, that is very, very valuable. What data will I use? What analogies will I, will I use? What comparisons will I, will I employ? So also you know that you will keep time and it's much easier to go back and change the pitch uh, after testing it out. I would also encourage you to write scripts for longer presentations as well, or perhaps sections of presentations, because the value of creating that script is very, very helpful. But the important thing is that you have to write the script exactly as you talk, because we write and we talk in very different ways. We write in long sentences, but we talk in very short sentences. So write exactly as you talk. Many people come to me and say, well, I've written a script, but I have such a hard time remembering it. And that's a sure sign that you have written a script that is more sort of literal than uh, conversational. If the script is written in a conversational way, you will have, uh, you will, it will be much easier to remember. Now, there are dictation tools you, available that you can get started. So you can just set up a couple of bullet points. You can talk freely and then let the dictator uh, sort of create the first draft of a script to you. So write a script. That's very helpful. Next thing is to use a timer. Practice with a timer. With practicing with a timer, you will know that your pitch is maximum 60 seconds long. But try practicing also your regular presentations with a timer so you know you will keep time next time you're presenting at a conference. Because 
I've moderated a lot of conferences. I've organized a lot of conferences. I've been to an audience to a lot of conferences. And I know that there's nothing more irritating for an audience, for a moderator, or for an organizer than speakers who can't keep time. And what do you think looks most professional? Is it when uh, you are talking and the moderator goes up on stage and say, well, I think we're out of time. And you say, well, I want to have four slides left. Or is it when you say, Thank you, that's all for me. I think I have five minutes left for questions. Okay, that's my little rant about keeping time. Now we come to the most important thing is to test your pitch or your presentation because no good presentation is created in a vacuum. You can't sit in, in your office uh, doing a presentation and expect that it will be the best presentation ever made. No, you have to go out and test it and get feedback from many people. Then you go back and change and each time you do the pitch or the talk, it will improve if you follow that process. But when you ask a friend or a colleague for feedback, don't just ask them, well, how was it? Or what did you think? Because they will just say, well, good, it was good. Ask them to retell your presentation in their own words, of course, but ask them to retell what you just have said, because that will give you much more information about what they actually learned from your presentation. Was the big idea the same as you had imagined? Was there certain words where they got stuck or stuck or some, some um, concept that they didn't follow along to? That's uh, where you learn when you test your presentation. Okay, so um, it's, it's time soon to wrap up this little mini work workshop uh, in uh, creating and crafting your message. But I like to encourage you to try writing the first draft of your pitch today. Set the timer for 10 minutes and write the first draft. It will probably be very bad, but that's actually good. You can write this down. Good is boring. I remember the first time in theater school, my first lesson, we were asked to divide up into pairs and to interview each other. And then we were supposed to go up and, and present the other person. And this is where I think I learned the most about presentation technique. Because we were asked to do this presentation in three ways. The first time we were going to do the presentation as we normally do a presentation. The second time we were asked to do the best presentation we had ever made. It was supposed to be amazing. And the third time we were asked to do the complete opposite. We should do the worst presentation we had ever made. We were allowed to fail with everything. And what of, which one of these three ways of presenting did, do you think was the best? It was actually the third one, because that uh, is when people were allowed to fail, things started to get more interesting. We were, were asked to do the best presentation. Every one of us just tried to uh, start remembering all the rules we had learned about how to make a good presentation. But when we were allowed to fail, we did things that uh, the audience didn't imagine. So it got more interesting. And most importantly, we started to show more of our own personalities. And that is the most important thing when, when, um, uh, when it comes to public speaking. We don't want to see someone who does everything right because good is boring. We want to see a personality because that's what's interesting. And that is perhaps the hardest way to um, becoming a better speaker, on to, to dare to show your own personality on stage. But um, so it will, so do a first draft. It will probably be very bad, but try to do it the, the worst pitch you've ever made and see if you can learn something on that, because then you will have something to improve on. Every time you do a presentation, you should try something new. Every time you do a presentation, you should, you should try something new. It doesn't have to be big, something small, something new. Because the more new things you try, you will get more data on what works and what not works. And over time, these experiences will accumulate 
and over time you will get a, improve your public speaking skills. But as I said, um, a presentation is just a way to start a conversation. Right, so um, I'd like to thank you for engagement during this workshop and for CV for inv inviting me. I will stay on for the Q&A session, of course. But before you, leave, before you leave this workshop, I'd like to ask you for three things. First, please write a sentence in the chat about your impression of this short workshop or what is your takeaway when you leave after the Q&A session, because it will help me a lot to improve. And you are more than welcome to connect with me on uh, LinkedIn um, if you want to have more um, skills, more presentation skills in general, or uh, contacts about how to coach researchers. And if you thought this was valuable, you can take a screenshot and tell about this workshop in social media. So uh, thank you very much for your engagement during this session. And uh, I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you very much, Anders. We have some questions and we have some tips also from, from our listeners. So I'll start with Mariana saying, excellent tips. I always dictate what I want to say and from that make slides or just pictures or keywords. And I guess that's also a very good uh, way of, of um, making the presentation. Absolutely. Then, I, that's my idea. Start thinking about what you want to say first and then find slides that sort of illustrates what you what you and emphasizes what you say. And both um, Marissa and Leonor say that I do rehearsal using Zoom for myself and record myself and then, of course, watch and learn. Have you ever done that, Andres, as well? Absolutely. That's brilliant tips especially in these um, you know when covid hit and we had to do all digital presentations i recorded myself a lot and tried to think of what is the most important things to to think about when we are doing digital presentations and one thing i would say that there is variation the more we we variate our performance on uh, zoom or any other digital tool that's how you keep an audience engaged. So don't just show slides all the time. Change between showing slides and just talking, because that will, that will create a lot of variation, and that mm. will keep the audience interested. That's great. And I think that's like half answer to Mariana, because I love these tips. However, I found that I don't listen when the speaker sounds bored. And how can you teach enthusiasm? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, uh, I mean, um, many questions that I get are about the, the tool. So what should I do with my hands? What should I do with my voice? But I think all those tips are when you have a subject that you are bored talking about. So you want to do something with your hands or want to do something with more to, create, to, uh, to make it more interesting. But I'm sorry, that won't do the trick. You have to talk about something that you are yourself engaged in, and that will spark an energy in yourself that will translate to the audience. So oftentimes when I coach researchers, for example, I have this story. Uh, a couple of years ago, I had a, a, an international workshop, and I had a researcher talking about corrosion. He was a chemist. So he started talking about the various kinds of corrosion, how it, well, the chemical reactions that happens. And then he stopped and said, well, this is the exact thing that happens on the old roofs in the uh, old town in Stockholm. Have you seen the roofs in the old town in Stockholm? These are amazing. And suddenly he lit up and everyone in the room just leaned forward and started to get interested because that was something that he was engaged in. So now I often ask researchers, what is it that makes you the most, what makes you most engaged about your research? It might not be, you know, when you're standing in your lab all day, it might be something around your research. Who are the people you are going to help with your research or the story, the background story, why you became a researcher that makes you most engaged and start talking about that then you will feel engaged and that will automatically make the audience feel engaged as well. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a uh, follow-up question as well. You said that we need to do something new 
to 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 especially with maybe online presentations and then marissa says something new like what oh uh, something new i i can't tell you but um it might just be something like well today i'm going to change the order of these two things and try to tell it in these ways this time i'm going to try to use this analogy to explain this concept this time i'm trying to not use any slides in the first five minutes or so so set up small challenges for yourself because oftentimes we see every presentation as a goal i have to get through this presentation but I think it's more of a process where every time you get a chance to present, it's a way to practice. When I started do it, doing stand-up, it's a very challenging uh, job in the beginning, but I set up small challenges for myself. The first one was, I'm just going to go, go up on stage, do my material and go off. And if I do that, I'm happy. Next time, this time I'm going to tell this joke in a more happy way and see how it works. Okay. I did that. Now I feel happy with myself. I did that. And that is what carried me on. And I learned a lot about in, uh, in the process. So see presentation as a process, not a goal. Thank you. Great. And we have also another question here coming from Elena uh, saying, like, could it be useful to ask questions to the listeners to keep them engaged? Absolutely. But I... Uh, some people just ask questions for the sake of asking questions. And that's not a good thing, at least, at least to my mind. Because if you ask the audience a real question, you have to take care of the answer somehow. And if you want, if you want to ask questions just to keep them engaged, um, ask questions that as many people as possible can answer yes to. This is not something you hear a lot, but it's the way of, it's actually a trick from the, you know, the American motivational speakers. They come into the, into the room and say, who wants more money? Yes. Who wants more energy? Yes. Who wants blah, blah, blah. And then you get people to say yes to them and they get engaged. As soon as you ask someone uh, a question that can alienate some of the people, it's about, well, who knows the capital of blah, blah, blah. Um, and some people don't know the answer, they can feel alienated. Um, so think about what questions you ask, how you're going to take care of the answers. And if you want uh, questions that engages people, try to ask questions that as many as people as possible can answer yes to. Great, thank you, thank you. Um, you have, we have a lot of comments for you later here in the chat. I'm trying to suss out the, the questions. And if you have more questions, just you know, uh, write them down. Um, I have a question when you're talking about engaging and not telling, telling it all at once, but engaging people by not letting them know everything. Does that mean that we don't have to wait until our research result is, you know, ready to present or ready to be published? Can we start engaging with people maybe as soon as, as, as we have finance for research and we say, we are going to do this research, we shall try and, and get to this uh, conclusion or results so that people get engaged maybe from day one? Absolutely. I think that is a very, very valuable um, way of, of doing your research. As I said, because all research impacts something or someone, and if you manage to engage with your stakeholders or if you're sort of uh, recipients for your research already in the beginning, you will, as Jenny mentioned before, you will know more about their needs, their how they see things, their perspectives. And that in, in, in turn will spark new questions, new uh, questions of interest that to you that might take your research even further they might ask you questions that you hadn't thought of yourself and that can actually improve the quality of your research. All right, thank you. Uh, we have some comments here from, from our various uh, engaged audi well, audience, we're not supposed to say audience, listeners, maybe participants, peers. Um, I feel energized for your session, very insightful. Um, Thanks for bringing focus to new ways of presentations. And um, 
Ooh, do we have more questions for Anders? Any more questions? Then I think I should read the last comment also from Induja. I think it's very useful. I have gathered the courage to break away from a useful way of making the presentation. And I think that's um, one of the Great, aims. Induja. That, that's <laughs> that's uh, what I like to hear. Because sometimes we get so used to the way of how everyone else is doing their presentation that we think that, oh, this is the way to do it. So, uh, for example, re many researchers ask, can I do this on a, on a scientific conference, for example? No one else presents in this way. But, uh, but to, it, it's about using your personality, as I said before. It's about letting your personality come through and think about what are the most important messages here that I, that I want to convey. That's the thing that you should talk about. And then you, shouldn't, you should do it in, in your way not think about how it should be done. I think we think of presentation sometimes that is something that is supposed to be something more than we are ourselves. This happens a lot when I coach researchers. They come to me with a draft presentation and it's, well, it's kind of good. <laughs> but, but then when we sit and talk just one-to-one, -one, I get the most amazing explanations of their research. And I say, well, you can say exactly that in your presentation. What, can I say that in a presentation? That's just me talking to you. But it, hasn't, it doesn't have to be much more complicated than that. It's like speaking to a friend. That is often the most effective way to come across in a presentation. Thank you. We have one more question. Um, Anna says, do you have any advice for dealing with presentation nerves? Yes, there are lots of tips and tricks for dealing with your nerves. Uh, one thing is to come well prepared, know your material, know your script. So you have it like, uh, you know it by heart. Um, um, so you don't have to go, out, go up on stage and think about where you are going next. Uh, the other way, uh, another thing is to think of your breathing. Oftentimes, when we get nervous, we get a lot of shallow breathing. But think about breathing out. Deep breath and breathing out three times. Because it's the breathing out that calms the body. But sometimes an effective way can be when I was training piano lessons when I was a child. We had my first piano training. Uh, a piano concert for our uh, parents and my hand I was so nervous that my hands started shaking so I couldn't really control the keys on the piano and I decided that should never never happen again so next time I practice for the next concert I try to put myself in that state of nervousness I tried to make myself nervous at home in that way I knew that even when I got nervous, I could get through the piece. So that could also be a way. Try to get yourself nervous before you're, when you're practicing the talk. So you know that even if I get nervous, I can go through with it, through with it anyway. Wow, that's quite interesting. And to practice how to get nervous. Um, great advice, Anna says, thank you very much. Uh, I also wanted to tell everyone that I've posted the link to the TED Talk, the YouTube TED Talk by Hans Rosling. It's in the chat for everyone. And um, I think Marisa agrees with me that, oh my God, that's that's uh, a challenge um, to get try and get nervous. Uh, Gabriella says, sometimes presenters are not the direct persons making the research um, or study and the information provided is limited. And this will be have to be the last question. How can this person uh, provide a bit more information in a short time during a presentation? Uh, so if, uh, if the pre presentation is referring to other people's work, is that yes, how I, I should interpret the question? I would interpret that that um, if you get, maybe we see, have another desk. Yes, exactly. If you have um, to present some other people's work and you don't have enough information, how do you get people to give you more information? Well, 
uh, yeah, um, I don't think I have any specific tips about that because if you have a limited information about what you are going to talk about, I think it's it's a bit tricky to com to convey sort of the key messages uh, of that uh, um, of that part. I think you would have to uh, engage more with the persons doing the research and try to get more a feeling of what the information uh, contains, so that you can be sure of what the key messages are. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I can give a better answer than that, but uh, if if there are any specific situations, we, we might talk about yeah. that later. And and maybe make sure that you have all that information and more before you start your yes. own presentation. Yes. Um, yes. As 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 a I can I can add always like as a journalist. Um, I mean, we always do interviews where we maybe take an hour and do an interview, and then we write. I don't know, a thousand characters, a hundred words, meaning that as we convey someone else's information or facts and knowledge, we have gathered always a lot more information. So that's maybe a, a practical way of doing it. Think of it as um, in a journalistic way that you're interviewing someone for a, a piece and um, maybe 10% is, is all of what you, you convey to the public, but you know the other 90% as well. Um, right. I think our time is up, Anders. Thank you so, hey. so much. Uh, thanks for Thank joining you very us much. again this year. And it's now time for me to present and introduce our next speaker, who is also going to talk about presentations, but in a totally different way. Uh, Jenny Rusquist, are you there? I can I see. I am here. Yes. Hello, Jenny. Hello. Hi. There. Hey, there you are. <laughs> Jenny, Jenny, welcome very much to, to uh, our workshop, Water and Communications. And um, you are going to talk about something that could be like a love-hate relationship, maybe to the PowerPoint, friend or foe. Hmm. Um, so I just leave it to you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I've been listening in a bit about what Andres said, and I'll, I'll probably repeat a few things since we're kind of co-workers, actually, or colleagues in, in the industry. Uh, I also work with presentation skills, and I'm a uh, scholar in, in rhetorics. So we probably have a lo lot of things that kind of in, in, intertwine. Um, so you'll probably recognize a few things I'll say during this session. Um, but it sounds like you've had a very productive and very interesting session. So hopefully I can I can add on a few more tips when you do presentations. And if you have any questions, as you did with Anders, just put them in the chat. And we have 10, uh, 10 minutes at the end to answer all the questions you have. Uh, so we've, uh, we've uh, uh, called this session PowerPoint friend or foe. And actually my first kind of message to all of you guys is that we shouldn't really look at PowerPoint or any other presentation tool that you might use. I mean, some of you might use Canva or Prezi or Keynote. You shouldn't look at any of those platforms as foes or as enemies, but rather they can be your best friend when giving presentations, uh, both for you and for your listener. But for it to kind of become that, become that best friend, become that support that both you and your listener need, you might need to consider a few things. And that's what I want to talk about uh, during these 20 minutes. Um, and during my almost 20 years as an educator in rhetorics and presentation skills, I mean, I've seen many fantastic slideshows and you've probably seen as many, maybe even more in your line of work. But unfortunately, I've also seen many, many not so great ones. And when I give feedback on people's presentations, I always go back to research and I always go back to what's the aim of presenting? Why do we do it? What's, what's the goal? What's the purpose? So that's where I wanted to start today as well, to look at what do we actually want when presenting? What did Anders want with his presentation? What do I want with this presentation? Well, it's actually quite simple. Uh, in my mind, you always want to reach your listener. 
you want your messages, your content to leave you and go <laughs> into the listener. You want your message out and your listener to take your words in, right? You might want him or her to understand something, gain new insights and um, uh, find new ways to understand something new in a way they haven't, maybe gain new perspectives. And with that new insights, that new understanding, that new knowledge, you want a person maybe to do something. It might be including that new insight into their own research. It might ma make them feel, ha, huh, that was very interesting. I'll dive deeper into that myself. So you often want two things. You want people to understand and you want people to take some sort of action. Um, so if you have those two words with you when kind of building presentations, starting from the purpose, as Andrew said, what do you want to say in your presentation? Start there and then find slides that support that. So that goes back to what Anders said here in the end. Um, but often, in my point of view anyway, and in my experience, is that this is where many speakers kind of get lost. We're so focused on our content and we know what to put into our presentations. Um, so we build speaker notes, we build slides that are more supporting us as speakers. And we forget about the listener. We build almost teleprompters that we can read out, li out, li out loud. Sorry. And when slides are used like that, they don't really become that support. And speakers using teleprompter slides, well, they often lack in energy, uh, engagement, and often, to be frank, they become a bit boring as well. So for the listener, it just becomes mental overload. And we'll get back to that in a bit later. But back to the purpose, back to what you want, right? As I said, it's actually quite, it's quite simple. Want to reach the listener, want to help her understand something, maybe do something. Um, so that's the rhetoric kind of view on presentations. You're there to deliver a message, to get your listener uh, to understand something, maybe give them something. So we want to build slides that clarifies and supports, exemplifies, uh, for example, for the listener. And you want to help your listener, right? So you want to build slides that helps her understand, that helps her gain new insights. And, you know, I wanted to be a bit more concrete than this. I can't just say this. I want I wanted to show you. Uh, you've seen many slideshows in your days. Me too. And I visited a page called medpage.com. And they actually asked their listeners or their readers, sorry, their readers, to uh, send in the worst PowerPoint slides they've ever seen or used. So they have a great collection. So let's look at what they have in their archive. You with me? All right, let's start with this one. I actually love the slice that looks like this because I get like, oh, what can we do to enhance this? Here, I mean, it's quite clear what, it, what's it, what it's about. But it's just too many things, too many arrows, too many things going over, inter interlocking. And it's just too much information. And this one, a completely different slide, loads and loads of bullet points. We'll get to how many bullet points you can use in one slide. And this one, well, maybe a bit too many. How about this one? Not the worst slide I've ever seen, but still quite heavy and quite small. There's actually a measurement here that you should use how small the size should be or how big, maybe. But we'll get there. Let's look at a few from my own uh, practice. This one. A very standard slide, right? A very standard slide text wall that I've used, that you have probably used, and that I see many, many times, and that I work with to kind of enhance and look for, as Anders said, what's the message behind all these words? How about this one? Mm. It looks almost like the, uh, 
the Parkinson slide we started off with. And still, we've added another challenge for you. It's in Swedish. You know? But still, a loads and loads of information and a lot of things, a very complex thing to go through. This one, here we have a lot of references, uh, research and results, and we're supposed to link it to a chart, a table, a very complex activity for your listeners, just maybe becomes a bit too much. And the last one, a timeline. And I mean, you might be sitting wondering, well, why are these slides so bad? What's the problem? You know, um, this is a perfectly good timeline. They've even marked the year to focus on. And that's great. It's clear that we want to focus on 2023. But the big thing here is that all these slides I've shown you here is that they're just a bit too much. Um, it's like too much text, there's too many figures, too many shapes, uh, too many lines, and so on. It's just too much. And it doesn't really matter if it's text or if it's too many elements, objects on a slide. According to neuropsychology, they just don't help the listener, but rather they leave the listener feeling, oh, well, a bit like, like this. And it has to do with how many kind of cognitive tasks we can perform at once. We are actually rubbish, and you probably know this, we are rubbish at doing many cognitive activities at the same time. Slides like the ones I've shown you, they create cognitive load and they split our attention. All has to do with this inability to multitask, basically. So when you're presenting something, when I'm presenting something with a slide, you often force your listener to do at least two activities at once. You might want them to read or at least take in a complex model or a graph or something. You want them to look at that and take it in. And at the same time, you want them to listen to you. You want them to listen to you elaborating on the graph. You want them to listen to you reading the text that's on the slide or something. You know, you're always commenting uh, on the content on your slides. So you force them often to read and listen at the same time. Two cognitive activities that clashes and actually makes us worse at understanding. We understand less of what we hear, and we understand less of what we read when we're trying to do the same thing at, at once. Uh, it doesn't really matter if you read the same text or if you're commenting on it and I try to read something and still listen to you. I've heard measurements uh, that we get 60 to 80 percent worse on both tasks. And that's a lot. You know, you can't lose 60 to 80 percent. It's just too much. So. Um, your task is to create less cognitive load, basically. And you should also be aware that it's not only these two activities that's ongoing in your listeners' minds, they might also be reflecting on the things they've heard you say. They might be linking it to their previous knowledge. They might be thinking, ha, oh, that's interesting. My father used to work with this, ah, you know, and then you've completely lost them. Some might want to take notes, quite heavy cognitive activity that you need to focus on writing while listening. And you always write the things that have been said, right? Or the things that you've read. And then it's quite difficult to focus on what's being said. So it's not only two activities, reading and writing, that often clashes. It's also reading, writing, listening, and reflecting. Four things. So if, you, if your task, as I said, is to create less cognitive load, less split attention, uh, you might need to think, okay, how can I do that? You want to help your listener find your important points, as Anders said, your messages, your facts, your context. So you need to make slides with the listener in mind. And maybe, I'm sorry to say, a bit less about your speaker notes, about your support. So what can you do? Well, um, if we go back to the slide we looked at before, the um, this slide, Parkinson's disease slide, if you're not going to use slides like this, 
what should you do? Now we're actually reaching the end. We only have 20 minutes for, minutes for this talk, so we'll end up in a to-do list. And my first tip, the big, the big tip, has to do with what Anders said. What's the message? Try to find not only the message for your whole talk, but also think, okay, what's my message in this slide? How can I sum it up? Uh, and if the message on this slide is, uh, it's messy, it's a lot, it's impossible to understand, well, then this slide might work really well. But if you're, if you want people, your listeners, your participants to actually understand pathogenesis and management, well, then you will end up spending a two hour seminar on it with this slide, nothing else, and you will probably still not have you have reached your goal. It's just too much information in that situation. I'll mention later on that this might be a great documentation material, material something that your uh, listener, your participant can go back to and link in things that they've, that, that they've learned. But maybe it's not the best slide to start off with. Maybe it'll just scare your listeners and create that cognitive load. So what do you want your listener to remember? What do you want him or her to understand with the slide at hand? Uh, if you find that and then ask yourself, is it possible to reach that with this slide? If the answer is no, then you need to have another strategy in mind. But that's my first tip. Find your message, not only with your with the whole talk, your whole lecture, but also with each and every slide. Some more tips for you. We can't just have one, right? We need more tips. And the tips I have now has to do with the design. My big message in this talk is basically build slides that help the listener. And here we can help them with some smart design. And the first point here is something that some of you might feel a bit uncomfortable with. Use animations. When I mention this, some people are like, oh, but I hate animations. Oh, you know. But often that has to do with, you know, they don't like the spinning animations, the star swipes, the, the, the animations that comes with sound. And I'm not talking about these ones. I'm talking about use the ones that helps your listener focus on one thing at a time. Just use what's in PowerPoint anyway, fade or peer, just to take one thing at a time. That works wonders. I've used it throughout this slideshow. Um, and I actually say that, well, you can use the other ones, the bouncing ones and, and so on, once in every slideshow you do. But people are a bit allergic to them. So maybe avoidance is better. But animations help your listener to focus on one thing and you can elaborate on that and then you can move to the next thing. If we had that Parkinson slide, we could have animated it. It would have taken a long, long time to go through it. You would have needed two, three, four hours, but still taking one thing at a time and building something together with your audience. Uh, as Andrew said, engaging uh, in a conversation rather than just putting everything up there and be like, yeah, this is it. Makes it much easier because it becomes almost a story as well. So animations, guys, use them. And mind the size and avoid clutter. You've heard this many times. Um, let's be a bit more specific. Think less is more. And it's difficult to have a measurement. I've heard measurements like you should have one headline, six bullet points, and six words. And I've also heard, you know, that's a 166 rule. I've also heard 177 and 1788. But I mean, the problem is not that you have six words or if you have six bullet points, then you should always limit yourself like that. The problem is that you put on too much information and it becomes this cognitive load, this split attention. So it doesn't matter if you have a bullet point list that's a bit longer or it's only three points. Think less is more and help the listeners. If there's a lot of information, animate it. Try to use keywords and try to avoid full sentences when you use um, when you use slides. And it has to do with making it 
quick and effective, easy to read, fast to read. So they can focus on reading for a second, split second even, and then focus on you. So try to avoid sentences that go over and over rows, but rather quick and clean and clear, you can think. And the last thing here is think that 18 or 20 as size, that's the lowest you can go. Have that as a, as a like, what do you say? Like a, like a glass roof for yourself. You never go below 18 or 20. Um, it just has to do with making your slides legible. Even if you're in a big conference room or a conference hall, or if people are sitting on their smartphones, 18 or 20, that works um, in, in many, um, in many, well, in many ways. And also um, remember that uh, this will help you to limit the amount of information you can have. But you can go 100. Go! You know, there's no limit to how big you can make your words. Um, try to capture your messages in your headlines. We don't really remember that much from a slideshow anyway. Uh, but if you can summarize things easy uh, for your listeners, put them in the headline instead of using um, headlines like results or uh, assessment. Why not actually say what was the assessment? What was the result? Like higher doses is not the solution. Or as you see here, help the listener with smart design instead of tips. So try to capture the, uh, the message in the headline. Then it makes it easier for you to know where you want to aim, what you want to conclude with this slide as well. And vary the impression. Uh, work with visuals. If all slides look the same, it's always one headline, six bullet points, six words. Well, then you will create, uh, you know, something that it bl just blends together. If everything looks the same, it's going to be difficult to say, yeah, that was the third bullet point list. But if you add visuals, and if you think more about shapes and colors and stuff like that, then maybe I can remember, yeah, that was that bullet point list with that green circle and that had to do with. So help your listener build memories in a more effective way by using variation in your slideshow as well. And as I mentioned before with the Parkinson slide, um, it might be a great documentation slide, but maybe not the greatest presentation slide. So think what slides can I use when I present? When the listeners are sitting in that room, they need clean and clear slides. They want to have, have a material that supports them in that situation. But when I'm at home, when you're at home, you can deal with heavy research papers and loads of graphs and things, because then you can focus on just that. You can turn off the radio, turn off the music if you don't want it. But in this situation, you can't. So this we here we need to create more clean and clear materials so that the listener can focus on that a bit for a bit and then focus on what you are saying. So the situations are different. We need different materials. And you could do this by having extra slides with that are quite heavy, walls of texts, you know, the Parkinson slide, all those slides, but you don't show them when presenting. You have them as read reading slides that goes with your slideshow when you send it out, or you can have it as material on the side that you send out. That's not, that's your choice, but you need to make that choice. What works as documentation, what works as presentation. The situations, situations are different. We need different materials. Right, my last slide for you guys has to do with how you present trying to think that when you build your slideshow, it should be easy to follow, almost like you are creating a footpath for your listeners. So the first step, when you arrive at the end of a slide, you should say something about what conclusions did we reach here? As we said in the Parkinson slide, you might end up with a short, short summary or message. So we can conclude that higher doses does not always lead to better results, for example. 
there you guide your listener to the message and you end your slide there. But before you click to the next slide, do a transition and mention what's coming next. Then you take your listener by the hand and help her with the transition from this slide to the next. So you might say something like, Let's dive deeper into what measurements we're talking about when we're talking about dosages. Click. Then your listener knows, okay, we're going to dive into dosages. Okay, she's already in that, in that state of mind, you know. And then the third step, this is going to sound strange, is actually be quiet, which sounds strange when you're presenting. But when you put up a slide, be quiet for just a split second or two, three seconds, depending on how much information is on your slide. Let your listener, your participant, take in your slide, your content, and then comment on it. Go back to the cognitive load, think, read first, or look first, and then listen. So that you try to help your listener with smart leadership through your PowerPoint or Canva presentation, your keynote presentation, your Prezi presentation. Guide your listener and think, okay, where do I want to end up with the message? What's the next step? And then guide them through. So uh, what I wanted to kind of reach with this talk, uh, where I wanted to end up is basically back here. We started off talking about what we should do as presenters, as speakers, and we should think that we want to reach our listeners. We want him or her to understand something, gain new insights, and we might want him or her to do something. And then we need to build slides. If we want to use slides, we need to build slides that clarifies, exemplifies, visualizes, simplifies, and supports the listener. And if you need support, well, then you can always have notes in your in your presentation. You can have a supporting material, maybe some notes on the side. There are loads of things that you can do to help yourself and support yourself. But think that the PowerPoint presentation, they should be there for the listener. It's him or her that should leave the room with new insights, new actions. So help your listener get there. And if you start working like that, well, then you might find yourself becoming like more vivid, more flexible, more animated, more engaged. As we talked about, how do you become more engaged? Well, if you talk more freely and talk more about things, then sometimes you can actually find your passion and you can find uh, your way of speaking that's not con constricted to your teleprompter words. So challenge yourself to build slides with the listener in mind and help the listener it's actually worth it there thank you thank <laughs> you very much we have also during your talk we have a lot of uh tips and recommendations coming in to the chat perfect so nice. that's great um marissa says can you recommend flip free platforms. Mm -hmm. Canva is one platform that's uh, free and available uh, on online. So she could use that. I know that Prezi used to be free. I'm not sure if it's free anymore, but try try Canva and see if that, that suits you. And it's also got animation tools. And... Yes. yes, and a lot of templates that look really, really professional. <laughs> so All right. it's a great tool to start off with, definitely. Great. Um, and below our teacher says animating slides can take a very long time. Mm. So how do we become a little bit more economical with our time? Well, uh, <laughs> I, I know it does take a long time. And um, but I mean, if you have six bullet points and you want to animate them, one, it's only, you know, market and animate. Uh, but that's also why maybe you shouldn't have that much information on each slide. It does become uh, become a way. If you have less information, then it will also become quicker to animate. So I don't have a better answer than that. Sorry. <laughs> but maybe it's very helpful to to actually have less slides and less information on the slide because we don't have time to animate. 
yeah uh, i've yeah. actually i i often say that you often become more flexible as a presenter if you have less information because then one slide can take 10 seconds to present but it can take also 10 minutes depending on how much time you have i mean you're always on a time crunch so having that less bullet points that you can just run through quite quickly or stay on for longer can actually make you a bit more flexible true uh, leonor has also posted a lot of design tips here about avoiding too many colors avoid using multiple fonts stick to mm. one uh, maybe uh, and bold or use larger font size for headlines etc mm. yeah um and natalia wants to know a very concrete thing here yeah uh, how did you make a transparent circle on the last slide? Um, actually, you can, you can play with the transparency. Uh, when I, I've done this slideshow in PowerPoint, and in PowerPoint, you can change the transparency, uh, just a slider uh, when you format an object. So that's quite easy to do, actually. So it's, it's practice and practice and practice. It is practice, yeah. Unfortunately, I'd love to say that oh, it's so easy, but yeah, it takes time to learn any any software it takes mm. time. And, and I would just um, like to ask, I mean, a lot of presenters and sometimes including myself, though, I'm not really sure how to do it anymore, uh, use these PowerPoints with the, the, the keynotes and, and the messages um, below the actual slide, and it becomes almost like the one comforting thing to hold on to when yeah. you do your presentations and then suddenly we should do we need to learn everything by heart now what do um, you think I mean you can still uh, you can have a lo loads and loads of notes in PowerPoint and other presentation tools um, and you can print that so you don't have to have it on your slides but definitely I I do understand that you feel like I need more support and especially if you're new to a topic and it's or it's new research or you're presenting something that you're a bit more insecure of often you need more on the slides and as long as it's not walls of text too much and you animate I mean you're, you're not going to destroy the, your confidence for your listeners if it's just a bit too much if you still animate and don't put it in 10 font and so on so you have to weigh what works for you and what works for your listener. So if you don't feel comfortable just having one word, well, have two then, you know, so you find your way and challenge yourself as Andrew said as well, start off by taking away just a few things and then taking away a few things more. And then maybe you'll end up just using the whiteboard and just, you know, huh, no more PowerPoint for me. So it's always a challenge and something you can learn and develop in. Thank you. Um, if we don't have any more questions here for Jenny, uh, I'd like to say thank you very much. It's three o'clock. It's the end of today's workshop. Thank you very much for joining us, Jenny. And uh, thanks to all of you who have contributed with tips and tools and um, recommendations here in the chat. As I said, when we just started today, that this is the last of our June workshops. And uh, there will be one more workshop in August. Uh, thank you very much. And um, remember, as Marissa said, we do have a LinkedIn group, so we can keep up the conversation on our LinkedIn group. Uh, I will be in contact with you again about the workshop in August. Thank you so, so much for joining. And thank you to everyone that's been very active and with your questions and comments. It's been a lot of fun for us. Uh, thank you to the Grundfos Foundation who's made this possible. And uh, thank you to Cecil for all your work as a producer. And um, don't forget to register for World Water Week. It's in August, end of August. And even if you're not planning to travel to Stockholm, this year online participation is for free. So you can always join us uh, at World Water Week, no matter where in the world you are.